Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Team Therapy. He's the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) Hello, Rhonda. (laughs) Uh, Hello, David, and welcome to all of our listeners and fans throughout the world This is the Feeling Good Podcast, and this is episode 348. Today we have a special guest, as all of our guests are special, Tom Gedman. Tom. Hi, Tom. Hello, Rhonda. Hi, David. (laughs) (laughs) Hello. Tom is a is, you know, maybe you haven't heard from his accent, but Tom is a general practitioner, family medicine doctor based near Coventry in the United Kingdom. He lives with his wife and his two-year-old son, whom I've seen pictures of and is absolutely adorable. Um, Besides being a family practice, family medicine doctor, Tom has an additional bachelor's degree in psychology, and he is a dedicated team therapist. He's certified level two practitioner, and he's one of the founding members of Feeling Good UK, alongside with Peter Spurrier and Derek Riley. And Dr. Gedman has also... had additional training in functional medicine, and that specialty attempts to find and treat the root cause of chronic medical conditions using advanced testing and a broad range of behavioral, nutritional, supplemental, and pharmaceutical tools. And one of the cool things about Tom is that he incorporates team therapy skills in his work with the National Health Service in his um, meetings with his patients And alongside his National Health Service work, he's setting up his own clinic named Blueprint Medical, which will incorporate team CBT, as well as functional and conventional medicine assessments and treatment to aim for a total physical, psychological, and spiritual health for his patients. Tom is going to start a free group health program in a deprived um, area of Coventry based on this combined work framework which he developed called, like I said, the Blueprint Plan. And Tom's been inspired by Team CBT since 2020, where he received a course of Team CBT from Peter Spurrier, which he says changed his life during a period of burnout at work that I think we're going to be talking about today. And also, it's been a huge dream dream of Tom's to be on the podcast, and he's delighted to have this opportunity to speak to David in person after the pleasure, thank you, Tom, of meeting me already during a UK Oxford team meeting in October of 2021, where it was my pleasure to also meet up with you. So there's a lot there that we can that's unpack. amazing, Rondo. I can't, I can't believe you managed to think all that stuff up of me. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you. What a kind and, introduction. And I want you to know, Tom, that this you, the area that you're in, the interface between medical complaints, especially those without any obvious organic complaints and emotional issues is one of my my favorite topics. And as I've mentioned to Rhonda many times, I, I probably never should have gone to medical school. It was kind of a mistake that I was sent there. And uh, uh, But I, I've always loved the psychological aspect. And the one class that I loved the most was with Alan Barber, who was the head of outpatient medicine at Stanford and he, we had they had all these thick chart patients who would come that nobody could diagnose and he'd he'd kind of listen to their heart and lungs and but ask them you know when the dizziness came on or when the when the when you first started getting this stomach pain or whatever their com- undiagnosed complaint was what what was what was going on and are, are there any problems in your life because the other do- other doctors were just focusing on medical stuff, and the patients weren't getting anywhere. And about half the time, there there was something uh, going on there, pretty big in the patient's life that no one had asked them about. And when they 
directed their attention to those feelings and that problem and began to take some action. Uh, 50% of the time, the physical complaints completely disappeared, and it was such a uh, such an eye-opening and gratifying experience. So uh, I just admire uh, uh, physicians in general who are working with the community, but also when you're working at that interface, I think is is really awesome. Yeah, it's it's amazing to see, and I I completely agree, David. I mean, it sounds like a, such an inspiring story that you had with your patients, and I, I think stress and, and and psychological, you know, complaints have a huge role in in chronic illness. Cause consequence, it's all rolled into one. And I think if you're able to address that as a priority, you often find some really transformational outcomes. My personal clinical experience as well. Okay, Tom, I can't wait to get to dive into that more. And Mm -hmm. um, let me read these couple of endorsements before we dive in. Um, One was sent to us regarding podcast. These are podcasts from our past 167, where Professor Mark Noble talked about Team CBT and the brain. And um, Anton wrote to us, this podcast episode is pure gold. I've listened to almost every podcast but somehow I miss this one and others that include Mark Noble. As a psychologist, I've always wanted not only to learn psychotherapy, but also to know how the change happens behind the curtains in our brain. I'm going to give this podcast and podcast 275 with Mark a listen, and for sure read his Brain User's Guide for Team CBT. Thank you so much for making this information available and invite Mark more often. With love, Anton. And how does it spell it? A-N-T-O-N? Yes. A-N-T-O-N. Well, thank you, Anton, for that wonderful comment. And I know um, uh, Mark Noble will be thrilled as well. And he, we, we, we love Mark. Uh, he's, he's, so, he's so giving and so smart and makes everything understandable. So even people like David and Rhonda can un- understand what he's talking about. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Tom... Um, Tell us, as a family practice medicine medical doctor, how did you get to a place where you were burnt out, and how did you find out about Team, and how did Team inspire and and you know heal you? Uh, Ron, that's a really good question. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I guess it had been a, a bit of a, a slow burn in regard to my burnout. I think it probably all started back when I was a third year in medical school, um, way back when. Uh, and, and I'd done well for the first two years, you know, quite high academic achievement. But in third year, I think you get thrown in with quite a few more students and uh, gradually a kind of some inferiority complex came in. It was the first time that I experienced what I now know would be, you know, clinical depression. I just felt so low in motivation, so really down, sleep horribly disturbed you know all sorts of physical changes as well as mental changes I just was just frightened about what actually happened to me and and I think it was just due to the stress and that knocked me over the edge and then I you know it let room for some really horrible thoughts about myself at the time and it was a horrible six months before I was able to almost just come out of it I think exam stress was over and then circumstances changed and, and gradually just came out without doing much in the way of you know real kind of cognitive work gradually cruised on for the next couple of years going in and out did a psychology degree in between medical studies to be able to kind of really work out how to be able to stop me from going into that sort of deep depression and anxiety again uh found some tools found you know some amazing uh some amazing therapists from the past like carl rogers was a huge inspiration for me and how you can have you know unconditional positive regard for people and it can be transformational and it really helped me to be able to develop empathy skills for for not only my patients but for myself as well it really got me out of a tight spot in many occasions but sometimes that would work and then sometimes it it wouldn't the work stress would get over me and I I had kind of therapy when I started work as a as a junior doctor working on the wards long nights uh, no sleep you know very stressful circumstances very tragic circumstances sometimes uh, and and it just kept on going and yo-yoing up and down until I qualified as a, a GP and general practice and uh, family medicine in the in the US. It's 
immensely stressful because it's not like any other specialty. You you have 10 minutes to be able to kind of make a decision about someone's health who's in front of you. And you don't have many tests available. You've just got your stethoscope, your blood pressure machine, and, and you kind of whipped about you. And you can feel a whole host of just pressure on you to be able to find the right answer all the time. And that pressure just got to me and it broke me. Um, and I remember vividly just really not wanting to go into work and, you know, every patient that would come in, you'd, you'd put a brave face on, you'd be as safe as you can, but really knowing like I was just struggling horribly and um, eventually fantastically, you know, kind of a lifesaver really the NHS, they provide a, what's called a practitioner health program uh, whereby you get free therapy as a, as a doctor, um, which is amazing. And, and that's where I was put in touch with Peter, who's my second cognitive therapist. I tried conventional CBT before and, and, and really had some minimal change, didn't really work. Um, uh, but then when I met Peter, it was just kind of a, it's a strange kind of light bulb moment <laughs> when, when he started doing some of the techniques. Uh, Cause I think he'd only just come back from a three day intensive with David uh, in uh, San Francisco. And I think he was probably just practicing on me, but he was a real natural. Um, so he he generally just kind of talked me through the testing, which I thought was a bit strange, you know, that I would never had this done before, but I thought, okay, well, let's go ahead with it. But I found that was such a deep empathic connection that, uh, you know, you really built a trust in him. And when the uh, positive reframing came on and the assessment of my resistance, it, something just clicked. Uh, and it was just something I'd never experienced before, just a real pride in what I thought were horrible things about me um and this in kind of persistent imposter syndrome that I was feeling and, and low mood and feelings of worthlessness and guilt it, it was just it was just a light bulb moment to feel let actually, me stop you know, for just just a sure, second because what ahead, you're saying David. is so fantastic uh you just said you were feeling uh w worthless and and what kind of worthless and and guilt. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I thought I wasn't being kind of good enough for the patients that I was seeing. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to write these down. One, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. What else were you telling yourself? I was I was hoping for this. I was hoping that you, we would go through a full therapy session. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Free therapy. You know, you know though, uh, Tom, some, sometimes negative thoughts aren't distorted. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I tell myself it every day. Um, uh, so I'm uh, not good enough. What else? Yeah. Um, it was that I, you know, it wasn't good enough. I, I was failing my patients. You know, I was going to do them harm because I, you know, I wasn't smart enough. Um, okay, well, let me write a minute. I'm failing my patients. Um, I'll do, do them harm. Uh, uh, I'm not not good at. I'm I'm not. Uh, yeah, mm. I'm. I, yeah, I'll do them harm. I'm not smart enough. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that's a great list. Any others? Yeah. And, uh, and I guess it was the the real killer was the hopelessness. It was I'll never be I'll never be better. Oh yeah, it'll always be like this. Yeah, and when you have those thoughts and feelings, it seems so real. Mm. I mean, it seems as obvious as the fact that there's skin on your hand. Uh, you know. You know uh, it's crazy. I remember you saying um because Peter prescribed me your podcasts the, after our first session. I remember the distortions podcasts. And I remember you saying how you can cope with pretty much anything, but having hopelessness is is probably the worst thing you can expect because it, it's just a thing. The negative emotions will never end. You'll never be able to get rid of them. And yeah. when I heard that, and then when I heard how you could actually, you know, find the distortions of what you're thinking, I think it just kind of set the gears in motion. I remember vividly just listening to that on a, on a shopping trip around Aldi in the UK. And uh, I think people were probably thinking I was a, a bit crazy for kind of just like <laughs> looking very surprised while listening on my, uh, on my earphones, holding some melons or something. Was, was that like, a podcast? <laughs> that was a podcast. You that were was a podcast. To? Yeah. I was listening to the wow. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And here you are. Wow. And here, here I am. It's like magic. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much. I I just love what you're saying. Well, yeah, I mean, and and I guess you know that that's where the the story continues. You know, Peter guided me through all of these things, and I remember listening to the first hundred podcasts. I think probably within two weeks. Uh, I think I just listened what, to what, all. What slowed all... you up so much? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I think it was, uh, yeah, it may, may have been work, may have been sleep, um, <laughs> but I, it was, uh, it, it was just fantastic and, uh, and, and a real eye opener and just to, and hearing all of your, hearing all of the kind of live cases of people transforming, it just made me realize that, you know, what I was experiencing wasn't a fluke. It was, uh, it, it was the real deal. Um, and, you know, it probably took about two or three hour long sessions to really, you know, reverse a, you know, a horrible set of thoughts that I'd had pretty much for as long as I can remember. Um, obviously coming out in more difficult circumstances when things were going well, everything was fine as you, you know, as you probably re realize when you're sure. in keeping with your self-defeating beliefs and you're, you're achieving everything you want to do, then, you know, it's all hunky dory, isn't it? But, but when times get tough, that's when, you know, the beliefs, they don't match, you know, the circumstances you, you start to, to free fall. And it was a horrible experience. Mm. Um, and, and and I don't know what it was. I felt like I was on a high for God, about six months uh, after that, just, just having kind of this limitless confidence in in what I was doing. And it all stemmed from an ability to kind of shave away all of the crap that I was telling myself and all of the inauthentic stuff. And it felt just like I remember you saying on one of your early kind of podcasts uh, about those sessions. What do you, what, you used to go to those sessions in there? Uh, was it Stanford where you used to really rip each other apart? And, you know, With externalization of voices, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. How that was developed. Uh, it just felt like that. You just cutting away all the, the, the crap and just having your true self just come out and not be ashamed of it uh, anymore. Yeah. It was just a, a hugely enlightening experience. And, and since then, I just, I kind of made a vow to myself that I wanted to be able to deliver this to as many people as possible. And, oh, and, wow. yeah. And, I thought uh, I thought I could achieve that, <laughs> but apart yeah. from the fact that I worked in uh, in the National Health Service in the UK, and we only get ten minutes with each yeah. patient, and uh, and it can be challenging to do a, uh, even a rapid CBT uh, framework in ten minutes, unfortunately. Oh yeah! Wow, amazing story. The um, that that high that you were on uh, for for six months. Would you say that was uh, similar to the concept of enlightenment? Mm. Yeah, I, I really feel that. I'd had sensations of that before. I'd done kind of these meditation retreats, like a like a 10-day silent meditation retreat uh, once. And I felt, you know, really realizations then and, you know, kind of a spiritual awakening. But but then when you get back into, you know, the, the hustle and bustle of the UK, you know, that all of the other kind of enlightenment seems to go away and get pushed to the back. But this was it was something that was persistent because you could always stop the relapse, <laughs> the inevitable yeah. relapse that you get. And you could just tell yourself that what you're thinking is just a load of rubbish. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. I've also wondered, and uh, there's something that uh, Jeremy Carmel, who, you know, Rhonda uh -huh. uh, wonders about too, is if getting all the way to zero on your feelings and getting to that ecstatic state, helps uh with a longer term i mean we, we are, we're all going to relapse forever go in and out of enlightenment but if that if there's a, an extra protective uh pow power to that whereas if you're greatly improved but still with some doubts and some negativity then then you're just gonna go into relapse uh, probably more quickly which isn't a terrible thing if you know how to deal with the relapses but that that that's something that I've that I've wondered about, uh, because when I've worked with patients myself personally, uh, or colleagues who were depressed or anxious, uh, that we, we can usually get them to you know where they're really in in a joyous state by the end of maybe a single two hour session. It's what I the way I generally operate, uh, and I think that I see much less relapse than than uh, say in the app that we've developed a lot of people get there but some people get you know very improved but not all the way and and then then they relapse and get better and relapse and get better kind of like a saw tooth type of mm. type of pattern but i'm just babbling and speculating so i'll shut up and let you keep talking well i think it's it's important to say that 
it, it, it's probably the one of the most important things to be able to appreciate the relapse. And, and Peter, when we did therapy, was very, very keen to do the relapse prevention training at the end of the, the sessions because yeah. when it is inevitable, when you do start to feel low again or if you can't start fighting off the thoughts, then uh, it can be a scary process. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, I had a, I had another setback about six months later, work pressure came on again. and But you just need just a little tune up and, and it took yeah. probably about half an hour with Peter just right. to, to yeah. talk through a few things. And, and, and that was it. It wasn't a whole new six week, six hour course. It was just half an hour tune up. And now I, I feel like I can kind of do the own work myself and just get out a brief, brief mood survey, a daily mood log and, and kind of go through that process myself and, and I'll go, keep on slipping in and out of it. But I feel like a bit more confident in, uh, in getting out of it now. I'll tell you what I do when, because, you know, I'm under a lot of pressures too. And, you know, mm. things happen that are, can be very upsetting to me. And, uh, and when, when you get into that dark thing, you can get thrust into it in a matter of minutes sometimes. Mm. And, and then it seems so real that this will be this way forever. I'd forgotten about this, this negativity mm. and, you know, my, my, my worthlessness and my hopelessness. But then all I do is tell myself, oh, well, come on, David, that's that's BS, you know, and two days from now, you'll be flying high again. And then I say, no, no, that's impossible. <laughs> and, and then I say, no, sh shut up, guy, you know, that's ridiculous. It doesn't seem that way now, but, you know, it's all that always happens. That That's about all I do. And I say, OK, I'll just kind of wait it out. And then a day or two later, I'm flying high again. It's funny because you have you do you can kind of almost kind of create your own situation i found that in the past you know sometimes taking a light touch and just saying okay we'll just wait this out and see how it goes is the best thing reassuring yourself because otherwise you know you thought negative thoughts can beget more negative thoughts can't yeah. you and you can kind of almost kind of you know metastasize out yeah. and kind of spread and spread and kind of grow into this huge monster wherever you just said you know that's bs and yeah. I'll, I'll just i'll see how it how i feel tomorrow but there's also a kind of loneliness about it because a lot of people just, including health professionals, psychologists, and, and certainly the general public, they, they, many people just do not believe that negative thoughts cause negative feelings. Until you've had that experience, once you've had that experience, there's no doubt about it. And I was working on a mathematical model over the weekend with some of the app data that, that proved, and we're, we're, we're uh, try to publish this uh, as soon as we get our outcome data in, in, in the works. Uh, our pa paper will be submitting soon for publication with some uh, uh, students at, at Stanford, uh, graduate students in psychology, and one of my former students who's now a professor of psychiatry. But we, we, I, I was able to prove using mathematical modeling that, that, the, that there's a massive causal effect of negative thoughts on negative feelings. Uh, and and that the 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 computer said I can guarantee you know to p is less than fifty zeros and a one that the causality is not in the opposite direction it's from thoughts to to feelings um, and it, the computer also rolled out rolled out the idea that some third variable is causing thoughts and feelings simultaneously it says the thoughts cause the negative feelings. And my belief now is it's impossible to reduce negative feelings without a reduction in the belief of the negative thoughts. And then people say things like, oh, but exercise helps. So that proves that thoughts don't count. But the exercise people aren't measuring changes in belief in negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. And during the exercise, you get to telling yourself, oh, I'm going to be better. I'm doing good things for myself. So your thinking changes. And mm -hmm. that, that's, the, that's actually the mechanism, I think, for everything uh, that that causes people to feel better has to be changing negative thoughts. But that that that's an extreme theoretical position, but it's I, I believe it to be true, and so you should take it seriously because half of the things that I believe are true, and the other half are bullshit. <laughs> Fifty percent of the time it works every time, right, David? No, I I I have to. I'm inclined to agree because I experienced it myself, and I, I think. I, I used to exercise a lot and I used to kind of eat the right things and, and I still felt crap. Um, yeah. And then, and then I changed the thoughts and I changed my feelings and I felt high 
And the the unintended downside to feeling really good is that you didn't need to do any running or eat healthily, oh. or, and you could <laughs> oh. drink loads of you know alcohol on on weekends, and 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 you still felt really great during the whole week. Uh, and the Buddha re- recommended all those things <laughs> in his early writings. Well, it's, and it's funny because because uh, it just goes to show that you you kind of have to have a little bit of both. I think having kind of neg- the positive thoughts can make you feel good, but I, I sometimes think. You know, having a bit of negativity can be right, quite healthy for some people because it really inclines them to kind of ex- exercise and find different, really helpful ways to be able to help their health. And then Absolutely. if that fits in with their kind of home beliefs about themselves, they're achieving and they're kind of they're achieving their goals and they're doing something useful. Yeah, I think that's the the kind of almost a missing variable that I think, as you said, maybe missing from those exercise studies causing you know benefits. I mean, I do I do sometimes believe that we we have sensations. You know, we can feel crappy or or feel fatigued or feel agitated, and that can be a kind of a physiological response. But I still think it's the thought that labels yeah. the emotion, which that's right, which which causes the emotional experience. Otherwise, it's just a sensation. You can say, "Well, that my tummy hurts." You could yeah. label it as as stress, or you could say, "I'm hungry." Is is you know, mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of two sides. You have to have the language associated with it to be able to make it a feeling rather than just a sensation. When when my thoughts and feelings change, and I go from be, being in the dumps to feeling joyous, my physical energy is transformed. Mm. You know, mm. if I'm, I, I can hardly run when I'm feeling down, and then when I'm feeling high, I can I can go out and run like crazy. Except now I get low back pain, so I'm very limited. But I I get out there and do what I can every day anyway. But. Uh, yeah, that's neat what you're saying. You had a question, and then I have a question to ask you if you're going to be doing groups at your new center. But you you go first, Rhonda. Well, I just think it's really kind of interesting that you randomly were assigned to Peter Spurrier when you got were going through the pre- practitioner health program. And you could easily yeah. have been assigned somebody who had a different style of therapy or a different perspective. And in a way, the way you've described it, sort of you, you hit the jackpot. Mm. Um and and I know that you're interested in providing that to other people in the UK and then and also the education so that somebody would actually say, oh, I know about team therapy and I want to choose this instead of just being randomly assigned anybody. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it was a gift. It really was uh, to be able to meet Peter. Uh, and he's just a, you know, he's a friend and he, he helps me out now uh, as well as being somebody, so, such an inspirational figure as well. Um, but yeah, it was, it was complete luck. So I feel like I have to kind of give that back and try and, and spread the word of team. The the unfortunate thing is I think team feeling good UK, it's a really fantastic organization, but you know, I've sent probably in my time about 5,000 text messages with feeling great. Um, <laughs> as like kind of a, as a treatment for people, I say, okay, well, after, you know, any consultation dealing with stress or depression or anxiety or, you know, here's you know a really good book that I'd recommend, and, and I always send your your book. Thank you. With, um, so yeah, you owe me a kickback there. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, ten yeah. percent of every single sale you've sure. had in the last six months. Um, but I, I don't think we've had one person that's come to Feeling Good UK and say, "Oh, Doctor Goodman has uh, just informed me of this." So maybe I need to kind of push the uh, turn turn the screw a little bit more with my patients and, and say, "Join the Feeling Good UK group." Because that's when you make the real transformations. It's such an amazing set of people that we have. Yeah, Peter's fantastic. He's he's so warm and kindly and thoughtful. As you say, he's a, a, a friend and an inspirational mm. human being. I have enormous respect for him. I have kind of a pro-British bias, I think, anyway. Because mm. I uh, there's exceptions for sure, but I just feel like the whole uh, British... Uh, re- research basis is more ethical and powerful and systematic, and that the people have a, a kinder, humbler streak than uh, in, in America. But I'm probably all wet. But I, it's it sure seems that that way. Uh, mm. That the uh, a beautiful spirit. Tell us about your plans now. You're going to have a this center. And you you mentioned doing something, uh, you know, uh, free group health for people in a underprivileged area or something like that. Or 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the uh, it's a project that's funded by a you know amazing charity in the UK called Think Active. Uh, so they provided some funding to be able to set up a group program for people in quite a deprived area of Coventry. Um and, and really it's as a lifestyle clinic. So kind of delivering, you know, information about how the benefits of exercise and eating right and sleeping right well and mm-hmm. avoiding toxins. But I think those interventions they're great but i think who did who did i hear recently say that if if information is all that you need then everyone would be billionaires with great abs or yeah, you know, right. a bit yeah. of a crass term <laughs> but um it, it's not just the information it's how you deliver it and, and actually there's a lot of reasons why people wouldn't want to, to kind of engage in these sorts of behaviors even though exactly it can be available so I'm keen to use the team framework, especially the kind of cost benefit analysis to be able yeah. to kind of really isolate what are the good reasons for not doing these things. And yeah, yes, exactly. Your decisions, exactly. You know? I so love that. I, so I'd love to weave that in um, and just see what the outcomes would be, whether we would get some good outcomes, uh, whether they say all of that team CBT stuff was a load of nonsense, uh, but at least it's feedback. <laughs> But I, uh, I think I'm confident. Uh, but I also just appreciate that the huge amount of psychological, often trauma that people go through is the reason why they, you know, are in certain situations with their health. And just having an awareness of that, it just means that I'll never ever judge somebody. I'll never ever blame somebody for the kind of the hate behaviors that they choose to do in life. You know, there's always a story behind things. It is really a question of do you want help and and do you want help from me and and if you do then here's some you know really good tools i'm never going to force anybody to do it it's it's everybody's own journey Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's also kind of a buddhist enlightened thing letting go sitting Mm. with 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 open hands Mm. the uh if these people are in an underprivileged area um we will be we may be launching the app this summer i'm not sure but um uh, I, I think our, our team would be very open to providing X number of, you know, free coupons for any of those people who wanted to get a, a year membership wow. with, with the app to supplement what you're doing at your center. That and would be incredible. That would be incredible. Well, uh, yeah. Well, then after the app, let's let's communicate about it and 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 set it up. It could be an informal study or something like that too. <clears throat> and see how the app works with this population of people. We'd probably even be willing to start a beta test with with that population mm-hmm. r- right away if you were interested, because it would be bringing in people who knew nothing about team. Mm-hmm. We've we've beta tested with about a thousand people, but there are a lot of them are podcast listeners, mm-hmm. and we'd love to get a a, a, a big population of of non podcast listeners, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, so uh, if, if if you want to do that, we, you know, I, I, I'm I'm pretty sure we'd be gung ho to to make it happen. You know, I knew there was a reason why I did this podcast today. I thought there there must be a really good reason. And it's, yeah. I think this is it. These kind yeah. of serendipitous moments. Uh, that sounds like a fantastic idea. I'd absolutely love that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Tell us tell us more about your center and 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 if people you know in your part of the country want to come come to you who, who uh, how they would contact you uh yeah so i've got a um a website under development uh it's under www.drtomgedman.com so d r t o m g e d m a n uh, dot com uh, and I understand how people would probably spell it wrong because even my wife despises the fact that she has to chat to change her name to something that no one could spell. Uh, so drtomgedman.com and uh, and also uh, www.blueprintmedical.co.uk uh, also under uh, under construction. I'm on, I've, uh, I'm on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter as well under the same name. Uh, let so, me yeah, just re- just let me just repeat that because uh, a lot of us are slow learners. Sure, yeah. yeah the, the Dr. Tom Gedman is your name without any punctuation, one big word. word. Exactly, exactly. Dr. D.R. Tom, yeah. T-O-M, mm-hmm. Gedman, G-E-D-M-A-N dot com. Mm-hmm. And then Blueprint Medical. Well, Blueprint is just B-L-U-E-P-R-I-N-T, mm-hmm. Medical. Dot UK and Blueprint Medical is one word. That's right. Yeah. Dot co. Dot UK. Dot what? 
co-co.uk. Uh, oh, I see. I missed that. See, I, I would have would have been unable to do it. So blueprintmedical.co.uk. Mm, that's right. Uh, okay, cool. Tom, before we get before you go off, I know that you in when you and I had talked that you have a special affinity and and you toward the five secrets of effective communication. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about how in your 10 minute sessions with, with your, um, your health service patients, your national health service patients, you use the five secrets a lot with them. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little, like how, no, how does knowing team therapy structure and how does knowing the five secrets help facilitate your relationship with your patients and their healing? Well, it, it was probably one of the, the biggest transformations because you're actually after the therapy, you learn a new skill. Uh, and I think I was empowered by the fact that it, when I learned the five secrets, it helped me in my clinical role and also at home as well. But, you know, clinically, it, this idea that you, strange as it sounds, you didn't have to always be the, the helper. You can be the listener and you can empathize and connect as a first approach was tremendously powerful. And I think that disarm of the uh, five secrets was it just showed the the person you were sitting sitting opposite that you really understood and you, and you agreed with them and i think people were kind of shocked when especially if you had a few people who were complaining about not being able to get you know an appointment with you uh, because that's a real struggle for a lot of people in the uk at the moment to get an appointment with their gp uh and say yes yeah, you know it's a horrible situation i completely agree with you it must be so you know horribly frustrating and disappointing for you to 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 be waiting on the phone for so long and i can imagine you you know you're feeling quite upset you know about that as well uh you know tell me you know how, how has this been affecting you and just being able to you know say that and obviously i'd say you know i, you know, I feel sad that this it's a current situation as well with the the national health service we just not enough appointments to to be able to to be able to provide the, the, the care for a lot of people at the moment and i think immediately you know even a person who would probably want to just spend the first five minutes complaining just being able to say that has just calmed people down immediately and, and got you on their side and and it adds to a more kind of compassionate and a really fruitful consultation where you know often people try and squeeze in so many different problems because they can only get one appointment but as soon as they realize that you you kind of understand and they're much more likely to be able to kind of book in with you the following week because you they trust you and they and they know that you know you're going to take them seriously which i you know i always I always try to do i love what you're saying tell, tell us more uh you know give us some more pearls or anything you want our us to know or our listeners to know just i'm hanging on your every word well it's funny because you know, I had some a few a few good things that happened with the five secrets. A few bad things. Um, I'll, I'll start with the. Uh, wish I start with the bad things first. Yeah, and sure. End, end with the good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I think early in the uh, in my journey through Team CBT, uh, I think knowing a bit about cognitive therapy can sometimes what is it called lead you up Mount Stupid in this uh, uh, in this kind of mental model. You feel like you know everything, and. Um, I remember somebody speaking to me and said they had a real severe agoraphobia. And I, and I thought, okay, well, how do you treat agoraphobia? Let, let's try some exposure therapy. And it was during the middle of COVID and, and uh, I, I wanted them to come down and see me because they had a problem. They needed to see a clinician face to face, but they really wouldn't want to come out. And I said, you know, we'll come down. It'd be a really good experience for you to, to come down and be able to see us. We'll be completely protected. It's a really COVID safe, you know, environment and end up getting into an argument and I didn't try to get in an argument but at the uh I remember him this this chap vividly saying that he was going to report me to the general medical council he was going to take my license away he was going to I don't know report me to the police he said that I had treated him worse than anyone's ever treated him before and I remember yeah. trying to claw myself back using five secrets and I think he hung the phone up at me and I was like oh, oh wow <laughs> I, I, love, think... I love hearing that that is uh, horrible I, I know, and it, and it was a bit scary, but then I, I ended up kind of keeping my composure, and then and then using the five secrets to be able to persuade a colleague to phone him back and make sure that he was safe and uh, and managed well. And so he he didn't complain, thankfully, and I, I still got my license to this day. It sounds like he was he, he had complained about other clinicians in the past, so I didn't take it too personally. Um, but I just thought it was it was funny how I was just trying to really kind of push him, but then it gave me a really strong lesson in 
stop trying to jump in and help just kind of yeah. listen <laughs> please uh so I, I didn't do that again which was good um but some some success stories uh i've had some really good ones actually there's uh, in the start of, of this i tried to squeeze in kind of a you know, an hour session in 10 minutes and it was quite frustrating uh, and didn't really work. But uh, after seeing kind of someone a few times built up that relationship, I actually managed to do a bit of positive reframing with um, with a, a, a student physiotherapist who was actually looking after her very po- poorly father uh, with Parkinson's disease. Oh, and she was... Sad. No, she was she was really really upset, and um, she had some you know bad relationships in the past, and we built a, a good kind of therapeutic connection, and then it just made her realise that her stress and her depression and anxiety were kind of real manifestations of the, the love that she had for her, her father and a real longing, and the you know the the tragedy that he he was he was kind of becoming more unwell every single day, and I think with that realisation, she kind of broke down crying, and she. she you kind of gradually became just like really proud of the thought. She never thought about something that way. And I remember I kind of, uh, I, think I, I think I cried a little bit too. <laughs> yeah, um, but it, right. Yeah, that's it was cool just such a that moment. happens. It, it was a real moment. And I remember just thinking, you know, I felt so close to her for, for realizing that. And I, it made me think, you, no one heals in isolation. You, you kind of, if you, if somebody else kind of has a, a real realization moment, you generally feel that that same way with them. And then she was kind of flying high. The next time I spoke to her, she was, you know, uh, you know, a lot less stressed, a lot less depressed. And I felt, you know, that was a really good, <laughs> a good thing that team taught me. And I've had a few really good cases for that as well. You know, some uh, an awful case of a, a chap who had chronic pain on huge amounts of opiate medication um, and, and it still wasn't touching his chronic pain. And, and, and gradually, even within t- one, 10 minutes, just kind of opening him up gradually and just gaining some trust using the five secrets was able to kind of un- uncover some historic childhood abuse, which was which was awful. And I think he said he'd never really discussed that with anyone before. And and over you know the course of two sessions, just really just listening, using five secrets, um, kind of re- reflecting back, saying how I felt about the situation. You know, he he almost cut his opiate use in half, and he just kept on reducing it down. He's still on a reasonable dose at the moment, but you know, a lot less and a lot less side effects as a result of it. So, you know, that tension and that stress of holding that trauma for so long, it, it kind of unleashed and he just felt a real overwhelm of of, of happiness as well. And, and it really steadied him on, on a journey towards recovery from his chronic pain. Yeah, do I understand that, uh, like Alan Barber at Stanford, you, you actually do have only still 10 minutes with each patient? 10 minutes of each patient but i um i generally see you know if i if i don't get after you know 10 minutes if we need to draw something to a close then i'll um i'll generally book them back in in a few weeks to see how to get on and continue it from there but i have to say that you know the 10 minutes is slightly lax especially in covid times when you're able to just speak on the on the phone you know generally it could run into 20 minutes i had some 30 minute consultations as well and my 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 poor um, loving wife was despairing at the fact that I'd get home at nine o'clock at night when I was supposed oh, to be yeah, home at, right. at six o'clock. Sure. And so there has to be a balance, really. Um, you, you can't give everything to everybody, but just those few cases where you feel like you know a bit of extra time would really would really help someone. I've kind of got a bit more in tune with with doing that now. Are you going to be doing any groups at the, in, in in the center that you're developing? Yeah, I, I think the group model is going to be the only sustainable model to be able to do this sort of thing, both the team CBT and also the the functional medicine, because one to one, you know, y- you can't have an hour with somebody that's an affordable, you know, solution to the to the national health service problem because you need to treat so many people. Yeah, you know, you haven't got the time or the expense. So, I'm really keen to be able to develop a group program that incorporates all of these tools that allows you to feel better, you know, think better, and also, you know, choose the right sort of things to be able to help you live longer and in, in, in good health as well. Another that's another thing we've done one experiment uh, with uh, uh, Zena actually, Rhonda, mm-hmm. uh, combining the app with a, a weekly group for four weeks and that and that seemed kind of synergetic also that's another thing that that you could experiment you know that we would be delighted to experiment with you if you had if you had the interest 
uh, and and some of the people they might not li li like the app, but th then you know because the app does all the technical stuff, mm. uh, and then you'd be able to use your warmth and five secrets and kind of individualize things for your for your patients, and but they would be getting uh, tremendous amounts of time. I would become kind of like your co therapist. Love that. Nice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd yeah. be amazing. You know, one of the things I really love about you, Tom, is that, you know, you had this great experience with Peter, then you, then you, for your own growth and healing, and then you were applying it in your own practice, you're creating a new kind of group practice where a team is, you know, functionally the structure of what you're doing with your patients, in addition to the, um, you know, your other perspective but you're also wanting to spread team like through team uk you helped mm. start team uk with peter and derek and mm. you had told us that you know one of your goals is to make sure that all medical schools in the uk are teaching the doctors um the five secrets <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a grand uh, it's a grand aim um you know i i think in the UK, we have to kind of prove concept first. I mean, it's still relatively unknown, although Peter and Derek and, and everybody at team, you know, feeling good UK, they're working so hard to be able to get it registered with the kind of national uh, BABCP, uh, which is the kind of accrediting body for all cognitive therapists. So they're doing some wonderful work to be able to spread the word that way. And also the four day intensive that's that's coming up in August, uh, which, you know, I'd love to speak a little bit more about. Um, but but once it becomes a little bit more well known, I think people would have a huge appetite for being able to kind of see how this works, because it it would be saving money, you know, you know, an hour session times four and getting some really good outcomes, you know, which team would probably be more likely to do than conventional CBT, yeah. improving that framework. And, you know, and, and I'm really excited to hear the data that you've got for your app, David, you know, I think if we're able to get that, that sort of data out there, then, then really, uh, I think team CBT therapists would be really high demand for the NHS and, and also the skills would be really high demand for medical schools. And the good thing about uh, doing a beta test, or even maybe after we, we open, you know, start selling the app, we're still going to be giving it away for free. But if if, if it's a beta test, then you 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 get t tons of data, like r really accurate, uh, really accurate data. You know, how are you feeling right now? And and you can see the changes in in the people, see who's getting better and who's not. I think mm -hmm. the group thing is is way more. Uh, effective than individual one-on-one -on -one therapy uh, mm -hmm. for for a lot of reasons. I, I I came to I've come to love groups. I teach in groups, and uh, uh, tonight I'll be teaching the the Tuesday group. Uh, are you in Rhonda's group? No, no, I'm not in there. I'm not in any. No, group he actually there. works I'm this, during the time that the group meets. Oh, okay. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, our, ours at Stanford is it. 5 p.m. and that's uh 2 a.m. your time you're not uh working then <laughs> <laughs> i'll put you i'll put in one earphone when i'm asleep and i'll just assimilate <laughs> some know, information yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what else do you wanna, well, well, Tom, you want to tell us yeah, yeah you said you wanted to talk about the team uk intensive in august are you involved in that too tell us about I, it i would love to talk about that yeah no I, i'm i'm hopefully going to get involved um with uh, with running some of the small group practice uh, it's a, a four day intensive august the 14th to august the 17th 2023 um in a place called wills hall in bristol it's a beautiful uh, facility with lots of accommodation so anybody who wants to come from uh, far afield in the uk or from further afield uh, you'd be happy to be able to book accommodation we're still doing early bird rates i think it's 440 pounds which is amazing value uh really considering the amount of work that you're gonna get i think it's 28 and um, cpd points which is just you know incredible amount of you know professional development and you also get automatic eligibility for level one team cbc certification i spoke with andy person who has got strong links with uh, richard lamb so sorry if i'm putting me on the spot and and this conversation didn't happen but apparently you, you get level one certification and also if you're already at level one you've probably got enough credits to be able to get to level two as well so it's a real uh it's a real way of being able to boost your skills if you're interested or even just kind of get to know what what's going on in, in a more structured 
way. It'll be just a lot of practice, a lot of applying the skills, and also uh, we'd be we're honoured to have David and hopefully you, Rhonda. I understand that you've got some other things that you might be doing. You've got some grandkids that you'd like to see, which <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's a good enough excuse to to not come. Um, but uh, we'll be honoured to have David doing the live therapy work with uh, with Mike Christensen and uh, uh, Lee Harrington and, and Dipti uh, and Marius uh, and Tanya and Derek and and Greg uh, and as well as Andy There's and the, Heather Clegg and Heather Clegg of course. Yeah. Um, and you know you just, said it was four hundred and forty pounds, um, which is about five hundred and forty five dollar US dollars. Mm-hmm. And if you think about you're describing four full days, and I imagine there's some evening sessions too mm. of training. That's just a little bit more than a hundred dollars a day for training. I don't think that you'll you could get that kind of excellent training with these fantastic teachers but i'm practical where do they go to get the registration and information because i'll I'll put it in the show notes but if we announce it everyone doesn't get or read the show notes so absolutely no no so it's the www.teamcbt one word dot uk and that's just the uk team cbt dot dot uk that's all www Team CBT, that's one word, dot UK. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, that's right. and then if they do that, then they get the information about this intensive from August 14th through 17th, mm-hmm. 2023. It's a four four day event. And you've convinced me, so I, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda will be there. You gotta get in early though, David, otherwise you'll have to pay an extra fifty pounds well, if, you know, if you don't get there early. Um no, no, we're, we're we're really excited to be able to do this, and I think it's just going to, you know, put the flag in the sand for the the Feeling Good UK group. Uh, I think it's going to be great. Yeah. Well, I'm proud to be associated with it. I'm just thrilled to to meet you. It's a breath of breath of fresh air. Thank you so much. No, thank you. It's been a, it's as I said, it's been a dream of mine to be able to be on this podcast and to be able to meet you. Um and uh, and it's so nice to see you again, Rondo, as well. It's so and nice hope, to see you too. Yeah, maybe we'll, see each maybe again. maybe we'll get you or Peter back or both of you after the uh, after the event, and then 100%. you can and and you can talk about you know what happened at the intensive. Absolutely, and the uh, Peter can do a live session with me as his as his patient as well. Oh we yes, have a, that's right. We yeah. have a load of imposter syndrome that's yeah, come back. Yeah, you can, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You have a relapse, <laughs> and, and then and then he'll cure you. Right, I'll have a, everyone's uh, eyes. a convenient relapse yeah. For, for everybody. <laughs> yeah, that would be very convenient timing. <laughs> Sounds great. I'd love to do that. Okay. okay. Okay, is there anything else that we haven't touched base on? I think we've covered everything that we wanted to talk about. Yeah, and I'm happy to to do this again if you'd like to to you know know more. I'm sure we could talk for hours, but uh, let's we can end it there. Okay, we look forward to doing that. And thank you so much. And yeah. congratulations on, on what you're accomplishing personally, uh, professionally, and I guess you said spiritually, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah it's, a huge, it's a huge thing. And, and, and I thank you so much, David, for being able to bring this to the world. I know you're, you're, you're kind of a modest guy, you know, but I think it's just the stuff that you're doing is really transformational. It's got the ability to be able to heal so many people. Um, I wish more people knew about it, uh, even though you've sold 5 million books in the US uh, and probably a lot more than that. But it's uh, it's really, you know, amazing. So thank you from the bottom. Yeah, of my really appreciate you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I appreciate you too, Rhonda. Oh, yeah, Rhonda. Don't, let, don't let, can't forget you, Rhonda. We <laughs> yeah. You don't have to appreciate me. I appreciate and, you more. Yeah. <laughs> and there's know, only one one fantastic, important last thing to say to bring this to closure, and it's it's going to knock your socks off, <laughs> and Rhonda's going to say it. Well, I think the, you know, the um, the key for me is that, you know, this sort of random person gets assigned to you through the Protection or Health Program. You find healing, and then you're spreading it throughout the UK to your patients, you know, in these trainings. And so, you know, they say it only takes one person to make a big difference. And that seems to be so true with you, Tom. And we really appreciate that. And Peter both. And Peter. Yeah. Peter, I said the same thing to Peter, Derek, if, you know, every person makes their own contribution and you're doing a really great job with that. So thanks. 
Thank yeah, you. congratulations and thanks. Okay, so lovely to see you both. Yep. Okay. Bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.